Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a pharmacist and I work um, on the Antifungal Drug Interactions Database. Today, we're going to talk about important drug-drug interactions with voriconazole. I'm hoping with this presentation, you'll get an overview of the term drug interaction. You'll be able to understand the mechanism of action of voriconazole and hopefully how we can manage the interactions when voriconazole is taken with other drugs. So drug interactions, a drug-drug interactions can be defined as a reaction between two or more drugs. And these drugs can be prescribed or they can be non-prescription or they can be plant-based. You can also get drug interactions between drugs and foods, um, supplements, drinks. So there's all kinds of interactions that can happen with drugs and other things. Now, um, Drug-drug interactions are one of the most commonest causes of adverse drug reactions. And the interactions can be classified in two main groups. One is the pharmacokinetic, which involves all the absorption, the distribution, metabolism and excretion, all involved in form the pharmacokinetics of a drug. And then we also have the pharmacodynamics, how the drugs affect receptors, what the body does, interference with biological or physiological control processes. And what, the, what can happen? Is there an additive effect? Is there an opposed effect? And all of these things can result in altered drug effectiveness, meaning that the drug doesn't work as well. Or we can get toxicity where the levels are too high. And again, a problem. So looking at voriconazole's structure and chemistry, what we can see is voriconazole is a triazole with a structure that's related to fluconazole. Its spectrum of activity is uh, comparable to that of itraconazole, but to improve and enhance the spectrum, one of the triazole moieties with a 4-fluoropyrimidine group was substituted with an alpha-methyl group. What this means is that you get activity against Aspergillus species and actually a range of other moles, which means we can use voriconazole for many other fungal infections, not just Aspergillus. Other considerations that need to be thought of um, with voriconazole is that because it has a high oral bioavailability, it's really good because you can switch between intravenous and oral treatments without any issues to the patient and without actually use it, losing activity against the fungal infection that you're treating. So um, current therapy using either the IV or the oral tablet formulation, you get a lot of flexibility in patient care and you can actually give um, longer durations of the antifungal um, with just one agent because you can use the IV and the oral interchangeably. Ideally, the oral suspension should be taken at least one hour before or two hours after a meal. A little bit like um, the kind of um, advice we give for flu, con uh, flu cloxacillin perhaps, so on an empty stomach basically. The tablet should be taken at least one hour before or one hour after a meal. And children have um, higher elimination capacity um, because, which is based on um, body weight. So in order to achieve the right levels in children, achieve the exposure that we need um, to it, for, for it to be consistent with how it would be for adults, we may need higher milligram per kilogram doses for children. That is quite normal because of the high elimination, so just be aware of that. Like other triazoles, voriconazole um, works as an antifungal um, agent by inhibiting the 14-alpha lanosterol demethylation, um, which is mediated by fungal cytochrome P450 enzymes. This inhibition is actually more selective for fungal than human mammalian enzyme systems. And when you get this accumulation of um, the alpha-methylsterols, this results in a reduction in ergosterol, which is an essential component of fungal cell formation. So what you get is a cell wall abnormality and you get holes in the cell walls. And this is what allows 
um, the voriconazole to have its antifungal activity. Hopefully this diagram um, demonstrates that complicated process with a little bit, of, little bit more ease. Pharmacokinetics, um, which sometimes people think is quite a scary word, it's really not. <laughs> um, and the pharmacokinetic properties of voriconazole are similar whether it's given intravenously or orally. So that's quite handy and useful. It's well absorbed because it's got around, um, it's got over 95% oral bioavailability. What one needs to bear in mind is voriconazole follows non-linear pharmacokinetics. So this means doubling the dose doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a double um, level in the blood. It, it can actually be quite exponential. So you could double the dose but get four times um, the levels in the plasma. So it is really important that this is bore in mind when doses are increased and increments um, when you do dose increase are kept small um, for that reason. Children, like we spoke in the last slide, may handle voriconazole differently. So it is recommended that um, those aged between 2 and 12, we use the oral suspension due to this because we can then increase in smaller increments, which makes it a lot easier because of the nonlinear pharmacokinetics. The main um, liver cytochrome P450 enzyme that's responsible for metabolism of voriconazole is the CYP2C19. Although 2C9 and 3A4 are also involved, 2C9 is um, subject to quite a lot of genetic polymorphism. So certain populations may be slow metabolizers and increased plasma levels of voriconazole may result. It's estimated around 50% of Northeast Asians and 3% of those with white ancestry may be subject to um, 2C19 genetic polymorphism. And it's something that we actually should um, be a little bit aware of, especially when um, we're looking at toxicity within patients. And TDM does become quite important in, the, in these situations. Other considerations um, for voriconazole and its interactions is that it is a substrate for and an inhibitor of CYP2C19, 2C9 and 3A4. So this opens, opens it up for multiple drug interactions with many, many drugs um, due to the involvement of so many CYP enzymes. Um, voriconazole concentrations may significantly be reduced by rifampicin rifibutin, phenytoin, and are also likely to be reduced by carbamazepine and long-acting barbiturates. And because of this, because the plasma concentrations um, can be reduced quite significantly, therapeutic drug monitoring does come into use if you are using these drugs um, together in any patients. Plasma concentrations of rifibutin and phenytoin increased significantly when they were given with voriconazole. So the other, the other thing happened, voriconazole can actually affect the levels of rifibutin and phenytoin. TDM is really important when you're using such drugs with patients because we need to know what is going on, especially if the anti-epileptics um, are going to affect um, control of these patients, the, the epilepsy control of these patients. There are other drugs which may be used in um, countries around the world like quinidine and pimazide. These are contraindicated because of potential QT interval prolongation um, and obviously can lead to um, the occurrence of tos adequant. It is really important that we take all of these into consideration, not just for these ones that are contraindicated, but any drugs that can prolong the QT interval. Um, and interactions between drugs such as voriconazole and medications for HIV patients are really complex. Really important to ascertain what these interactions are, so look them up and make sure you do the right thing by your patient and manage these interactions effectively and properly to make sure we don't get treatment failure either with the voriconazole or with the antiretroviral drugs. We're just going to go over a few examples on how to manage interactions with voriconazole. 
So voriconazole and alfentanil. Alfentanil is a short-acting synthetic opioid which um, is often seen in ITU settings. It's extensively metabolised by cytochrome P450s, 3A generally, and voriconazole, as we know, inhibits 2C, 2C19, 2C9 and 3A4. Patients receiving voriconazole probably require 70 to 90% less alfentanil for the maintenance of analgesia. So because an, um, voriconazole inhibits 3A4, what you get is an increased level of alfentanil in, in, in the patient, in the bloodstream. It doesn't mean that we can't use these drugs together. All it means is that we need to reduce the dose of the alfentanil. So adjust the dose accordingly. What I'd recommend is perhaps starting with a lower dose than you would normally be accustomed to and titrate up very, very slowly as needed and monitor your patient for side effects and see what dose works best. A drug that we've been um, starting to use a lot more due to COVID at the moment is um, dexamethasone because we know it works as the recovery trial has shown. Voriconazole and dexamethasone, there is um, interactions that we need to be looking out for, so that's why I've included it in this presentation. Um, we know voriconazole is metabolised and inhibits many cytochrome um, enzymes. Dexamethasone is a moderate inducer of 3A4, so voriconazole is inhibited to some extent by 3A4. So voriconazole can reduce the clearance of dexamethasone, which means it increases the levels of dexamethasone. But dexamethasone can also increase the metabolism of voriconazole, so reducing its levels. It doesn't mean that we can't use these drugs together. So what we need to look at is be aware of and manage all of these interactions appropriately. The solution is, is to reduce the dexamethasone dose initially and um, do some therapeutic drug monitoring on the voriconazole to ensure that we have adequate levels and we're not, we've not got sub-therapeutic levels, meaning we're going to get um, treatment failure. Voriconazole and omeprazole. Omeprazole is um, quite extensively used across the world um, as one of the PPIs and omeprazole inhibits 2C19. What we know is voriconazole is um, metabolised by and it also inhibits um, 2C19 amongst other um, CYP enzymes. Because 2C19 is significantly involved in the metabolism of voriconazole, there is theoretically um, a significant interaction between voriconazole and omeprazole. Actually, we don't need um, a massive dose adjustments just that when you're initiating patients on voriconazole, uh, when you're initiating patients on voriconazole, um, that already you're receiving um, doses of omeprazole of 40 milligrams or over, um, it's good practice and to reduce the omeprazole dose, so halve it. Anything above 40 milligrams is potentially a problem. Anything lower may not be as much of a problem. Going the other way, we can use this um, to our advantage actually to boost the levels of voriconazole. There are studies that show when patients have been taking um, omeprazole and voriconazole, there's less chance of failure and actually because of this boosting effect of the voriconazole. Again, TDM may play a part in this, so make sure that if you are giving your patients any drugs that may have this um, potential for interaction, that can affect levels, then TDM of the antifungal agent, in this case the voriconazole, becomes quite important just to make sure we're not causing toxicity in your patient. We spoke a little bit about voriconazole and carbamazepine interaction in a previous slide. Um, I just want to emphasise that the use of these drugs is generally contraindicated and this is because um, co-administration of voriconazole and carbamazepine is likely to reduce um, voriconazole concentrations, levels in your patient quite significantly. There may be instances where no other drugs are suitable and we can't really change the carbamazepine or the voriconazole for many reasons. So if 
use if concurrent use is essential because there are no other alternatives available then i guess the the advice is to monitor closely for the voriconazole efficacy tdm is really important so monitor the levels as much as possible and don't be afraid to increase the voriconazole level because the ultimate aim is to not have antifungal treatment failure so be aware of that and know that actually increasing the levels if a patient is on carbamazepine actually may be the right thing to do for your patient quicker, sooner rather than later. I wanted to put this um, drug in just because ibuprofen is so readily available and we can easily buy it over the counter and in supermarkets and we still need to be aware that there are interactions. Ibuprofen um, is a substrate for CYP2C9 and as we know voriconazole inhibits 2C9. This can lead to significant um, increases in levels of ibuprofen. So just because you can buy it over the counter doesn't mean it's not without its risks. But it doesn't mean that we, a patient who is taking voriconazole can't take ibuprofen. It is really important that we counsel our patients on what to monitor for adverse reactions to ibuprofen and toxicities and perhaps advise them of a dose reduction of that particular non-steroidal um, rather than taking the maximum dose, halve it perhaps and see whether that helps to get rid of the pain and if not then there's scope to increase or perhaps reduce the dosing interval. So it's not that they can't take it but a dose reduction of the NSAID is what I would recommend. I want to thank you for listening today and I hope that's given you some insight on how to, mar how to manage um, interactions with voriconazole. Um, please look out for other presentations in the series on how to manage interactions with antifungal drugs.